2000. And he joins us now live from London. Dickie, I know it is a difficult day for everyone in the UK and around the world. And for you personally, you're very close. It is difficult, uh, but one's got to be pragmatic. The Queen was incredibly pragmatic. And it's interesting, isn't it? Prince Philip died on the 9th of April 2021. The Queen died today, the 9th of September 2022, 17 months later. I don't think she ever really recovered from the loss of Prince Philip. He was a liege man for 73 years. And when you've lived that long with somebody, depended on them, depended on each other, it was a tremendous loss. We saw this lonely figure sitting, because of social distancing during the COVID epidemic, of sitting alone at the time of his funeral. She did cut a lonely figure. We've seen her gradually, unfortunately, deteriorate, getting very frail, having mobility issues. And we saw that delightful picture a couple of days ago, 48 hours ago, of her meeting her 15th Prime Minister, Liz Truss, what a difference 48 hours makes. Dickie, I wonder if, um, if you can shed um, any light um, on, on what just happened in, in the last couple of hours and also just the process of what will be taking place behind closed doors. Let's start with, with just what happened, first of all, with who was around her um, as she passed. Well, in the last uh, few hours of her life, uh, the doctors were there and the statement was released uh, just before lunch today saying there were concerns for her health and uh, although she was comfortable. It was that that triggered the family uh, descending on Balmoral. King Charles III and Queen Camilla were really just down the road at Burke Hall, which is his uh, Scottish home given to him by his late grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, in, who died in 2002. So he would have rushed there pretty quickly. The rest of the family uh, would have headed towards Northolt Airport, just outside of London, boarded a plane to Aberdeen's Dice Airport, and then an hour's drive from there. What is quite interesting, and I find extraordinary, the Prince Harry wasn't on the same aircraft mm. and making his own way there and probably arrived, if indeed he has arrived, after the death of his grandmother, which is very sad in, in, the, in the circumstances. What will be happening now? Well, there is a very clear, laid-out funeral plan. It was written years ago. I, when, when I was at Buckingham Palace from 1988 to 2000, I had a hand of rewriting some of it, sort of modernising it. And it would have been approved by late Queen Elizabeth II. So that'll be, be putting into operation by the Lord Chamberlain's office at Buckingham Palace. There will be the next 24 hours, her coffin will stay at Balmoral in order to give estate workers and locals an opportunity of bidding farewell to their boss. After which it will then come down south to London and will probably go to either Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle, the respective throne rooms, where it'll stay for about three or four days before moving to Westminster Hall for the lying in state, where the public will be able to file past and pay their respects before the ninth day when the coffin will be taken to Westminster Abbey for the funeral service and thence on to St George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, for the interment. So it's a very lengthy period, a very long period, and a very sad period when people will be able to express their emotions, whatever way. I believe that Australians will be doing the same. She'll be sadly missed uh, by Australians, by members of the Commonwealth. We've got to remember that her 21st birthday speech, if you remember that, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, mm shall be devoted to you and the great imperial family to which we all belong. Mm. Well, we don't have an imperial family anymore, but we certainly do have a Commonwealth family. And the statement that she made, the whole of her life, meant the whole of her life until she drew last breath. And she remained Queen Elizabeth II until she drew last breath this afternoon at Balmoral Castle. Beautiful words, Dickie.
It's um, and just that emotion that, that that you say. I mean, that will be felt right around the world. And I know it was her jubilee celebrations. Even then, she signed off your servant, and, and that was her, wasn't it? Right as you say, until her very last breath, it was it was about service to her country, and she was that one constant over seven decades of, of extreme change, that stability, and, and people use words like steadfast to describe her, which are quite old-fashioned words, but that, that was her, wasn't it? Ali, you said it all. It was about duty. It was about continuity. It was about commitment to the people. Who can forget those words that she uttered during the start of the COVID pandemic on the 5th of April 2020, in which she said, and, and you said earlier on, uh, we will see our friends again. We will see our families again. We will meet again. Very stoic, very, uh, very much for the people, very much person who gave confidence to the people. They looked to her. When there was a time of celebration, they went to Buckingham Palace, they looked to her. When it was time of tragedy, they looked to her. And who can forget the uh, Platinum Jubilee, the appearances on the balcony after uh, Trooping the Colour. She didn't go to it, but she appeared on the balcony to a roar of, uh, of spectators, all the way from Buckingham Palace, all the way up to Trafalgar Square, almost a quarter of a mile. And then the Platinum Jubilee itself, when she appeared on the balcony. And that wonderful sequence, you mentioned the opening of the Olympic Games and the sequence with James Bond, but something that overtook that completely was that wonderful sequence with Paddington Bear and the drumming on the cup and saucer uh, to the beat of the drums, We Will Rock You, that got picked up by the Royal Marines drummers outside the palace. She was a wonderful woman and people will remember for her commitment, her duty, her love of people, her love of the Commonwealth, her love of Australia, of the realm states. Nobody can, can forget that and nobody can take that away. Well said again, Dickie. Um, I wonder um, if you can also just elaborate a little on just how um, this all happens. Um, obviously, um, King Charles III um, is now um, the reigning monarch. But how does how does that happen um, after after she passed, uh, and, and what is the order of events there? Well, there's a tradition. Um, uh, there were complaints, for example, at the time of the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, there wasn't the flag flying at half-mast. Now, when Queen Victoria moved in there in 1837, the only flag that ever flew was the Royal Standard. And uh, there was never any other flag. So when the sovereign wasn't in residence, the Royal Fla Standard came down and the flag wasn't replaced. The, Royal, the, the, the sovereign never dies. We have the Queen's death today, the Queen is dead, long live the king. When the king died in February 1952, the king is dead, long live the king. So it's a, it's a smooth segue transition uh, from one reign to the next. Yes, he will be proclaimed from St. James's Palace uh, tomorrow and throughout the land, but he does automatically become king because that is how the monarchy works in the UK and has worked for over a thousand years. So it passes immediately and it almost passes invisibly, doesn't it? But then, I mean, you knew Charles, or you know Charles. I mean, behind closed doors, yes, he's lost his mother. But to now step into those shoes and to be the reigning monarch, and I mean, he's, I think he's the oldest heir apparent or the longest serving heir apparent, and he becomes the oldest king at 73. What would be happening in the discussions he'd be he having indeed. and feeling? Well, he will realise, I mean, he's known his destiny since the day he was born or the day that he was able to understand what his destiny was all about. He will be devastated by the loss of his mother. Mm. He's just kind of got over the loss of his father last year. And now, 17 months later, his mother has died. He was very close to her, despite what various reports have, have come out over the intervening years. He will feel that she's a very hard act to follow. She was very pragmatic, she was very straight. Uh, she wasn't involved politically, but she was able to have her au weekly audiences with prime ministers, 15 of them. Well, Liz Truss never had, a, had an audience, but she did have a meeting when she was uh, appointed and kissed hands uh, two days ago. 
but she was able to have these meetings with prime ministers knowing that whatever was discussed, nothing went beyond the four walls of her audience room. And as far as the people were concerned, she was a queen of the people. You mentioned earlier about the walkabout. Um, she invented the modern walkabout. Let's not uh, move away from King George V and Queen Mary, who actually invented the walkabout during the First World War. They visited troops convalescing in hospitals. They visited, visited various areas that were bombed by the Axis powers. So they invented the walkabout, but the Queen very much invented the modern walkabout, and people were appreciative of that. Uh, to actually have the Queen stop and talk to them. That had never happened before. And it was innovative for, for the Queen to suddenly be in immediate contact with the people that she was reigning over. And that was quite a move forward. When her mother died, um, and the Queen has always evolved during the course of the reign, she always used to wear sort of floral print dresses, um, rather dowdy, I think most people would say. But when her mother died, she suddenly transformed into bright colours. She always said, I have to be seen to be believed. And my goodness, when she transformed after the death of her mother into emerald green, turquoise blue, cerise red, canary yellow, you could see her from the moon. Um, so she really was seen to be believed. She will be desperately missed, not just by, by the people of the United Kingdom. She'll be missed by the realm states, which Australia is one of them, and I'm sure many Australians will miss. Yes, there is a, a, a Republican undercurrent there. There's a Republican undercurrent here in the UK, but people will miss her. People will miss her at the Commonwealth. They've already missed her at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings, of which Prince uh, King George III, uh, King, King Charles III now presides over. So she will be a figure that's missed. She's been around on the throne for 70 years. She's met every president of the United States except L LBJ. Uh, she never got to meet him. She's met every world leader. Some of them have died years ago. Uh, some of them are not. I mean, Gorbachev was, was probably the last world mm. leader she met who died only last week. So she will be sadly missed. And the king will find it a very hard act to follow. But he will do things differently because we know, we being the globe knows, his thinking, his thinking on climate change, his thinking on the environment, on education, all, all sorts of issues. He'll have to rein in. Uh, because he can't voice opinions as king in much the same way as he did as Prince of Wales. But we already know what his opinions are. And these opinions will then be taken up by Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, who will ultimately, in the fullness of time, become the next Prince of Wales. Dickie, um, we're looking now at live shots outside Buckingham Palace. It's hard to fathom a more universally loved leader. Uh, you're going to see a, a huge outpouring of emotion there. Um, you're saying that, that, that Balmoral may not lend itself to such a, an outpouring of, of grief and celebration of life. Um, but in the next couple of hours, I suppose um, the King will, will make some address of some kind. He's already released a statement, a very pointed and, and quite emotional statement. Mm. Um, but you, it's hard or hard to fathom them not actually coming and, and doing something, or maybe it's tomorrow. But either way, there's going to be tens of thousands of people um, around the clock outside Buckingham Palace now. Um, as I said before, this woman was loved. He will make a statement, uh, ultimately. Um, I'm not sure what broadcast crews are up at, uh, at Balmoral. I'm sure they've all scrambled up there. So there will be something coming from him. But I think for the time being, he needs to be left alone in his grief. And in the fullness of time, probably tomorrow or even the next day, he will come out and he will say something. Uh, because he, he's very good in front of the camera. He's very good at doing pieces to camera, as his mother was. And he will want people to know about her, about her last hours, about him, uh, and about his reign. He might not give much away, but he will come out and say something. It is a difficult time, particularly when, as I said earlier, you've lost your father in April 2021 and your mother in September 2022. To lose two parents in the space of 17 months is very hard for any family, irrespective of what your age is. And Charles is 73, going to be 74 in November. But yes, we will hear from him because he knows that he's got to say something. 
uh, and he won't be backwards in coming forwards in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, Dickie, I did notice too that um, as the people gathered to mourn the passing of the Queen outside Buckingham Palace, a rainbow appeared, which I don't know, I just think that's something that's just a quite lovely thing to note. But it was the BBC, it was 3.32am our time, uh, which announced the passing of the Queen. Do we know, because it did ha seem to happen so quickly, do we know if her family made it in time to say their farewells? The majority of the family did make it. Um, I'm not sure whether Prince Harry made it because he decided to go under independent means uh, while the rest of the family got on the plane at Northolt. Uh, King, the King and the Queen were at Burke Hall, which is just down the road from, uh, from Balmoral, so they were able to get there pretty early once the, the bulletin had been issued, and probably even before, because they would have been called by the private secretary, Sir Edward Young, that uh, the doctors are about to issue a statement and he should get over there, and he would have got over there. The rest of the family arrived uh, the course of the afternoon. The uh, Duke of Cambridge came alone because the Duchess stayed behind because her children's first day at school. Uh, which nobody would begrudge that. The Earl and Countess of Wessex uh, were also on the flight. Princess Anne was already up there, as was the, the, the Duke of York. So Prince Harry, I'm not sure whether he's arrived. He was going independently. Um, that remains to be seen. A great pity that he didn't make it uh, before the death of his grandmother. That would have been the right gesture. But, you know, who knows the way they operate. Um, you mentioned Camilla then. Uh, obviously, um, Charles, uh, King Charles, you mentioned that she's Queen Consort. Uh, you also said, queen, how, how will she be referred to? And, and just take us inside her life now. Well, she would be referred to by her name. Her name is Camilla. She'll be referred to as Queen Camilla in much the same way as in, in, in the reign before the Queen. It was King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. So uh, in this reign, new reign now, it'll be King Charles III and Queen Camilla. Oh. Uh, that's how she'll be referred to. She'll be very good. Uh, she's been terrific when Charles was Prince of Wales in supporting him and encouraging him in reigning, in, reigning him in when he sort of looked as though he was losing it, which not very often. Uh, she's very good with people. When she, when she talks to somebody, she gives them quality time. She looks at them, she looks them in the eye and talks to them, not over their shoulder, to see who might be more important. But she does give the individual quality time before moving on. She's very good at charity work. She's very good at osteoporosis, which her mother died of. And she's been very innovative in children's literature, in getting children to read books, and even got a, a, an Instagram site in which she reads books in the hope that children are going to follow suit. So she is going to be a tremendous support um, to King Charles. She's going to be tremendous support to the country. And I think they'll do a terrific job. As I said a moment ago, a hard act to follow Queen Elizabeth II, but in their own way, they will do it. Mm. Dickie, can I ask you, when did you realise that there was something seriously wrong and that she had perhaps passed? Because it, it's very rare for her doctors to release any mm. medical information about the Queen. They always keep that very quiet. So when they did that earlier today to say that she was comfortable but had taken a turn, was that at that point it was very clear that, um, that she had passed or was going to? I, I, I'm sorry to have to say this and admit to this, but... When the uh, mobility episodes were first announced at the end of last year, I had a sneaky suspicion that the Queen would not last 2022. We've seen her come back and forth. She did quite a few things over Christmas while she was up at Sandringham, and she looked terrific. And then she did a few things after Christmas. She missed the service at St George's Chapel at Easter, something that she never missed before. Uh, she was, uh, yes, she was at uh, Prince Philip's funeral, uh, which was a very sad occasion for her. But every time we'd seen her, she looked to be becoming frailer and frailer. Uh, and there's only so much a body can take. And then we got increasing mobility episodes where, yes, she was going to do something and then pulling out at the last moment. Prince Philip's Thanksgiving service uh, ca comes to mind. Um, various other engagements. Um, 
Remembrance Day, something that she never pulled out of. Uh, she was always there because she was the last serving head of state, the only serving head of state who actually served in the military during World War II, albeit in the ATS. So there were things that were, that were actually booked for her to do, but she pulled out at the last moment, much to the disappointment of a lot of people, more so disappointment to her that she wasn't able to do it. And every time we saw her, and particularly the last time we saw her, which was a couple of days ago when uh, she met Liz Truss and asked her to form a government, she looked very, very frail. You mentioned earlier her hands were blue. That's as a result of the lack of um, oxygen, the right oxygen getting into the bloodstream. And it was very, very noticeable. But she did look frail. And anybody who had any doubts would have wondered then. Uh, it's not a case of if, but when. And she never really recovered, did she? She canceled the, uh, the privy purse. Um, cancelled the uh, Privy Council meeting. At that meeting, the new cabinet ministers would have been sworn into their jobs. That was cancelled. And then today, um, the medics announced that there was grave concern. And as soon as they use words like grave concern, you know that something is seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. And it, they weren't wrong. They were, they were right. And this afternoon came the news that she had died peacefully. of Buckingham Palace as we go to air with Thousands are gathering in shock and a little disbelief. This is how it all unfolded. At 9.30 last night on Australia's east coast, 12.30 in the afternoon in the UK, the palace issued this statement. Following further evaluation this morning, the Queen's doctors are concerned for Her Majesty's health and have recommended she remain under medical supervision. The Queen remains comfortable and at Balmoral. Within two hours, the royal family rushed into action. Prince William, Andrew and Edward flying into Scotland. Charles, his wife Camilla and sister Anne were already there. The media watched on as the royals arrived at Balmoral, their faces solemn. Prince Harry also seen arriving as the world learnt the news we didn't want to hear. At half past three, the palace released this statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. And half an hour later, this from the new King, Charles III. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of great sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. It was, of course, only on Tuesday that we saw the Queen greeting the new British Prime Minister at Balmoral. And three days later, Liz Truss spoke of her shock at the Queen's passing. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. As she said, the United Kingdom is in shock. And this is the scene outside the palace where black cabs are lining the streets for a moment of reflection. The people across the UK devastated. The Queen was everything I'd grown up with. Um, she was iconic. She was... I, was... I was called Sally Elizabeth because I was born in the year of the coronation. We've lived in Windsor for a long time and it's very emotional, so I wanted to 
pay some respects to the Queen. It will be very, very, very difficult being without her. We all love her very much. Oh, you really feel it, don't you? Uh, in the centre of London, people are stopping for a moment at Piccadilly Circus, where the Queen's image has been put on the big screen. Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, 1926 to 2022. Australia is also reeling this morning. This is a live look at Sydney Harbour Bridge where the flags are flying at half-mast. That's a scene replicated right across the country and our Prime Minister speaking a short time ago. This is a loss we feel deeply in Australia. Queen Elizabeth II is the only reigning monarch most of us have known and the only one to ever visit Australia. And over the course of a remarkable seven decades, Her Majesty was a rare and reassuring constant amidst rapid change. Through the noise and turbulence of the years, she embodied and exhibited a timeless decency and an enduring calm. Her Majesty served our nation and the Commonwealth for 70 years. Lovely words from the PM. The Governor-General also addressing the nation. When I reflect on my own memories, and she was my queen for my entire life, I think of Her Majesty's dignity and her compassion, her dedication and her work ethic, and her selfless and unwavering commitment to those to whom she served, to us. And in the last few moments, the South Australian Premier has spoken. Her Majesty has been one of the greatest examples of dedication and serviced in human history. For the entirety of Her Majesty's life, she has very much been a shining light to people around the world. Well, while the Queen was a public figure for her entire life, she was also a mum and a grandmother. This tribute from Sarah Fergus and the Duchess of York. I'm heartbroken by the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. She leaves behind an extraordinary legacy the most fantastic example of duty and service and steadfastness and a constant steadying presence as our head of state for more than 70 years. She has given her whole life selflessly to the people of the UK and the Commonwealth. To me, she was the most incredible mother-in-law and friend. I will always be grateful to her for the generosity she showed me in remaining close to me even after my divorce. I will miss her more than words can express. And this from the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, shutting down their website with this message. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, 1926 to 2022. Let's bring in Royal Editor at the Daily Mirror, Russell Myers, who joins us now from London. Russell, I mean, we've been seeing all morning. It's, it's not just the UK, the whole world is in mourning. Well, good morning, Ali. And aren't they just? I mean, it's not just the scenes that you're witnessing outside Buckingham Palace or Balmoral Castle. The pain of the Queen's death is being felt the world over. And I think that uh, the outpouring of emotion and grief is absolutely palpable. The, uh, you could see the pain not only etched on the royal family's faces as they were rushing to try and be by the Queen's side as she was uh, in her final moments, but when you're looking at the people gathering outside these palaces and, uh, and speaking to people as we have been today, it's, a, it's it, an absolutely tremendously sad event, of course. And what is it, Russ, you know, that, that is behind that? I mean, she, she was 96, we knew that she was unwell, yet there is this overwhelming sense of sadness and, and shock from people. Well, there is. I mean, even that uh, the pictures that we saw of the Queen looking fairly frail on Tuesday, she welcomed the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, uh, and, and uh, leaning on her stick, she, her hands looked a bit um, bruised, her ankles swollen. I think we all just felt an overwhelming sense of, uh, of protection over her. And, um, and certainly that's the feeling that we've, we're feeling across the country today. Um, the fact of, you know, you've seen in your tributes about how deeply, deeply personal everybody felt about the Queen. I mean, this is someone who touched the lives of millions and millions of people around the world. And even though so many of those people did not, not even set eyes on her, let alone come close to her, they felt a deep, deep affection for someone who had given so much, so much to, to duty, so much to the country and indeed the Commonwealth. We spoke uh, just a couple of days ago, didn't we, um, about uh, that meeting with the new British Prime Minister and uh, the fact that she 
didn't look um, her best that day, um, was probably in ill health, but there was something about her that kept carrying on, wasn't there, Russell? And no one ever quite thought that we would get to this. Well, it's a day that we never thought would come. I mean, the, the Queen is like an enigma, an aura, um, and, uh, and people just relied on her presence. And I think that the world is not only a tremendously sadder place today, it has changed beyond recognition. And what does this mean for, for indeed, not only the royal family, but for the, the, the world's view? Um, I mean, it, it tells you something about the, the dignity of the woman, that she was absolutely steadfast in her duty, that she wanted to, to perform that duty to, to welcome the new prime minister, even though she had been feeling very ill. I understand her, her mobility problems have been really increasing of late. And of course, um, she had a, a, a downfall after that. She had to miss the Privy Councillors meeting the next day, which was tremendously important. And I think that there was an air of desperation in the air, in the air and certainly um, we are where we are today, unfortunately. It was such a beautiful thing to say, Russ. She wasn't just a leader, she was an aura. And I think mm. that's what we collectively feel around the world right mm. now. Well, we do. I think uh, you, you just look at the amount of tributes that have come in from world leaders, um, I mean, esteemed politicians as well, the charities that she worked with. I mean, this was a woman who had associations with hundreds and hundreds, I think about 800 charities over her 70 years. I mean, a feat that will never be repeated. Uh, someone who was not only the head of her family, the head of the country, but indeed the Commonwealth as well. And I just think when you look at the outpouring of grief, I, st I just can't quantify it at the moment. I mean, we've, we've often prepared for a day like this, but the office absolutely fell silent. And I'm sure we will see uh, some tremendous, tremendous scenes over these coming days. Well, if we just look ahead over the coming days, 10 days of mourning now, and I mean, this will be a farewell to remember, won't it? Well, it will. I mean, it'll look very, very different to, I think, how the plans potentially would have worked out because the Queen has died in Scotland and that puts in place a whole different raft of plans. It is called Operation Unicorn. There will be uh, different uh, plans laid out of how long the Queen um, is, uh, is lying in state as well. When will she return to London? Of course, King Charles III will go on a, a sort of whistle-stop tour of the United Kingdom. He will make a public address to the nation, indeed the world, tomorrow. Um, and uh, I think there are just so many moving parts at the moment but what we will see is an overwhelming sense of grief and gratitude for a woman who just gave so much throughout her life. Can I ask this Russell I know it's early days um, but we've just um, we've seen some images of the US President Joe Biden um, I think he's laying a wreath at, at the British Embassy in Washington DC yeah there it is right there. And his wife Jill. I mean, the, the planning um, for what's about to to happen um, you're 100% right. It's been in the workings for, for some years out of necessity because it's going to be such a big occasion. But, I mean, it, it, this is going to be probably something the like of which we've not seen before. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and, and the fact that you may never see again because the, the, the details of, of how many people want to pay their respects to the Queen. You're not just talking about world leaders, you're talking about the charities that she affected. But, you know, there will be millions upon millions of people around the country and around the world. And I think that, you know, you speak to the people who have been planning this for decades, and there is a real concern that, you know, London could be to become so packed it could be overcrowded. I mean, this is the, the situation that we're dealing with. But, I mean, every single um, tentacle of the, of the, of the British um, a machine of, of, the, of the way that government is organised is working absolutely overnight and uh, 24 hours a day for the next few days to make sure that this is a fitting occasion and that uh, indeed everybody is able to pay their respects along the way. Well, we were talking about it before, Ali and I, um, even just to get to a Buckingham Palace in the coming days, as, as from every walk of life they come to that place right there that we're seeing now, uh, it's going to be big, uh, probably the biggest thing we've, we've seen in, in London in a mm. very long... I can't even, in, in my recollection and memory, think of, a, of another occasion that's going to be quite like this. Um, and it's People going to be come from all everywhere. The world. Yeah. Well they, well, they will. I mean, you, look, you saw the Platinum Jubilee celebrations that I was had a, lucky enough to have a front row seat at, and that was absolutely mind-blowing, the amount of people who were on the streets. And that was obviously a hugely momentous celebratory occasion. And I think what a fitting... You know, end to the to the Queen's life, but this is yeah. totally different. Yeah. This is something that will be an outpouring of emotion, perhaps we haven't seen since the days of Diana's death. And Indeed. I do think that uh, the, the, what we will witness over the next few days um, will hopefully, hopefully, be fitting to, to a woman who just gave so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your words, Russell.